is your professor coming to you once again from his living room. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to this, our second to last lecture before reading week, which I'm sure everybody is very excited about. How the heck are you doing? Say, uh, say hello in the chat, and I shall say hello to you as well, although that's not a promise. Um, yes. 27 concurrent viewers. That means we can get 27 likes on this video. Hey, hey. Um, anyway. I hope that everybody's doing okay. I think that we will have our office hours for this class at 1.30 today on Teams. So if you'd like to drop by, pop by on Teams, then uh, please do so. Please do so. Anyway. Um, so, with respect to lecture material, we were not quite finished with topic four, arrays. We had just we just had to analyze binary search, and then that was pretty much the extent of it. So, just to recap binary search. Binary search is an algorithm, and in that way it's similar to many other algorithm, algorithm. What will the midterm be on? Um, who knows? I guess. <laughs> I'll know better once I've written it. Ho ho. I have not set the test yet, so I can't tell you what's on it. And I probably wouldn't tell you even if I had set the test, to be honest with you. Um, might give you some hints, but, you know. We'll see. We shall see. Anywho. So, for binary search, if we take our... Um, if the object of binary search is to determine whether or not a particular element is present in, a, in an array... You might return the index of that element. You might return a simple true-false. Doesn't really matter. With respect to the operation of binary search, it operates by, oh, I should say, binary search requires the array you're searching to be sorted. We generally examine the middle of the array and make a decision based on the value there as to what half of the array the value we're looking for must lie. Um, if the uh, middle value is less than the value we're looking for, obviously the uh, value we're looking for has to be higher than that, so we take that side of the array. We then operate the exact same search, but on this, excuse me, now reduced array size. Uh, and by so doing, we reduce the amount of the array that we have to look through by half each time. So the number of steps we're taking is actually equal to log base 2 of n, where n is the number of elements in the array. So let's talk about this. Because we are having the search space in each step, this is a big O log base 2 algorithm, log base 2 of n algorithm. This is considered a good complexity. Anything, anything better than linear is good, and linear itself can also be considered good. Um, incidentally, sometimes within the context of computing, log base 2 is written as simply LG. Sometimes log base 2 is written as log. It depends. Um, in some computer scientists' Uh, some computer scientists are so ingrained into their field and the binary system, uh, the fact that the logarithm's base is 2, uh, some people to take that, take that to be implied by the fact that you're talking about a computer. So sometimes they just say log, which is a little bit confusing, and it would be better if it was standard standardized, but, you know, it is what it is. Um... Yeah, sometimes we are not concerned about what the base of the logarithm is because of, like, base 2 reasons. 
um, you can think of it as contributing to the constant pa uh, part that we usually ignore in uh, big O notation. But, um, you know, it, that, it's just a thing to be aware of with logarithms in computer science. So, because it's a log logarithmic relation, 1,000 items can be searched in only 10 steps, and a million items can be searched in only 20 steps. So you can see how this is a really good way of, like, it's a good search. Uh, it's much better to check 20 times than a million times. The other thing to keep in mind about this is that this is the worst case runtime. If you find the element you're looking for sooner than that, you can, you know, you can substantially reduce this total. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, that's an analysis of binary search. Um, just as a side note, there are also searching algorithm, pardon me, when you start getting into data structures, you can uh, place restrictions on the manner in which people add data to data structures in order to maintain properties like sortedness. Um, so if you think if you think in this manner, if you are adding a if you are adding an element to an array in such a manner that the array is still sorted, um, finding the spot to put it in if the array is already sorted, uh, that's just a modify. You can modify binary search in order to achieve that goal. So, in some sense, we might be depending on how much how long it takes to move the memory around. Um, inserting an element into a sorted array um, is that 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 amount of time. You can front load the um, the time it takes to sort an array by sorting elements as they get added to an array, if you if that's the manner in which the array operates. But anyway, that's that's some complicated algorithm stuff that I don't even have slides to support, so let's just see the last slide comic. The traveling salesman problem. Brute force solution, n factorial. O, big O to the n factorial. Dynamic programming algorithms. Big O of n squared times 2 to the n. Selling on eBay. Big O to, one, to the 1. Still working on your route? Shut up. He says, shut up. Anyway, so there you go. Oop, I've got a question. Burp, burp. Is using binary search to make the insertion part of insertion sort faster a thing people do? Um, maybe. I don't know. That's an interesting combination. Um, I don't know. You should look that up. See if it's been done. Check Google Scholar. See if that's a thing. And if it isn't, publish a paper on it, man. That might all... Somebody may have already thought of that, but if nobody has thought of that yet, then uh, you get to be the person who thought of that. So there you go. Anyway, so that concludes Topic 4, Arrays and Introductory Algorithms. Um... It took us four lectures and a bit to get through it, and it is 49 slides, so I imagine it's probably going to take four lectures and a bit to get through pointers, which are 54 slides. Although a number of these slides are, um, some of these slides are like big groups of code, so it might not be the best analogy. But anyway! Software Engineering 2 MP3 Programming for Mechatronics, Topic 5, Pointers! Bop, bop, bop. We're going to talk about working with pointers, pointer operations, base systems, the wonderful world of passing by reference, pointer expressions and arithmetic, pointers to functions, and dynamic memory allocation. So I should note that I'm not actually quite finished with these slides yet. Um, you can expect a new version at some point where the last section has a few more slides in it. But, uh, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me if there are a few spelling errors here and there. I, um, it's, uh, yeah, anyway, that's the state of things.
So, let's talk Pointers in C. From, uh, and here's another comic for you. This is Dinosaur Comics, which if you don't know it is, used to be funnier, but you know, that's true of a lot of comics. T-Rex in programming advice. Are you having trouble programming your computer? Let me give you a few pointers. Ooh, ouch, was that a bad pun? It was an indirect reference. I, suspe I suspect that these are all bad puns. Don't worry, they're the least significant bit of my speech. Oh ho, jokes explained. Aren't pointers programming tools, T-Rex? They are. They allow to one to reference the address of data instead of the data itself. It's like how knowing someone's phone number lets you get in touch with them personally. Hence the delightful indirect reference pun. I think these are pretty awful. I too think these are pretty awful. Conclusion. Everyone, program harder. I agree. Um, and I have a quote. When a wise man points at the moon, the imbecile it examines the finger. And that's by a person a lot of quotes get attributed to. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be imbeciles for the course, for the duration of this topic. Uh, so, what the heck is a pointer and why should I care? Pointers are one of the most val one of the most valuable and powerful constructs in C. A pointer is a variable whose value is a memory address. So, if you think about your physical memory apparatus inside of your inside of your computer, how do you think a computer knows what memory is where? Answer Every cell in your memory has an address. It has a unique numerical identifier. These unique numerical identifiers are used by the hardware to look into the memory, look up what the uh, state of the bits are at, the, at a particular memory address, and then load that into registers in the CPU in order to be you know, processed in the normal manner that we would process things. So what pointers allow us to do is they allow us to capture the actual physical memory addresses that the computer is using to store such things as variables and array elements. So learning how to manipulate pointers is learning memory management. So let's learn some memory management. Where most variables directly reference the value stored at some position in the memory, pointers are indirect references. In this set of slides, we're going to talk about pointer data types, pointer operations, and applications of pointers. So, pointerization! A pointer is not declared as a new data type, but it, it, it modifies an existing data type. So, if we have int star pointer, PTR, the star character indicates that pointer, that PTR, is an integer pointer. This is to say, uh, PTR pointer, my pointer, should have called it my pointer, points to a segment of memory the size of an integer. The star character may be applied to either the data type or the identifier itself. However, in this formulation, int star count pointer and count the star only pointerizes count pointer in this example. So this one, it binds the star character regardless as to whether you put it here or you put it there, it always only binds to the first um, identifier. It only binds to the first identifier. So this one is not a pointer. This is just a regular integer. If star were applied to int count pointer would still be only the only variable that was pointerized. Any questions? Questions? Okay. In Blockovision, this is how this is what's going on here. If we have count and we assign it some value seven, the name count directly references a variable that contains the value of seven. The pointer count pointer 
indirectly references a variable that contains the value 7, but only once we assign count pointer the address of count. And we're going to see how to do that very shortly. There's an address of operator. You can create a, a pointer out of any data type, including custom ones. When we, um, a bit later on in the course when we talk about structures, structures are, um, they're essentially, they're kind of like records, but uh, a structure can contain fields of many different uh, data types, but they're allocated as one contiguous memory block. A, you can have pointers to structs, uh, and the size of the memory the pointer indicates is the size of the struct. So the uh, star character, asterisk character, means something different when you're not declaring a pointer. This is not part of the identifier. So this is an important point, so to speak. Although, so the star character sets count pointer to be a pointer. It ch modifies the data type, but star itself is not part of the identi identifier. So if you wanted to use the pointer, um, you leave off the star unless you're using star as an operator, which it does in that context, which is a thing we're going to get to when we talk about operations. So there you go. So. Since pointers are a more direct ma manipulation of memory, you can squeeze out some efficiencies by squeezing in some pointers. So, what types of efficiencies, you may ask? Well, take, for example, uh, we're going to talk about passing by reference. In order to pass by, in order to pass by value, you're copying data. Copying data takes time. If you instead pass a reference to a variable instead of passing the variable itself, what you end up with is you you save yourself the copying operation. Essentially, I've got some questions. Boop. If Python doesn't use pointers, or at least I've never seen them used explicitly, then how does it deal with pointer stuff? And that, as in, how does it get away with having users never use pointers directly? So the manner in which Python handles pointers, it does do pointers. So the thing is, they just don't call them pointers. Um, so if I lo load up my handy-dandy Python 3 in interpreter, if you have a list, right, lists being dynamic um, data structures, right, there we go. Um, if you assign h to the value of l, right, there's h. But if you modify, um, if you modify some value in l, then you also modify the value in h. That's because uh, in Python they call it aliasing. But what is really going on underneath the surface is, I believe, if you invoke IDL, yeah, hex, uh, oop, hex IDL, there you go. And if you, um, so notice that the, um, the ID values of L and H are exactly the same. That's because these are pointers. So Python is using pointers, and you can expose the fact that Python is using pointers. However, Python kind of, it structures itself such that you don't need to use pointers to do useful things. Many of the, uh, another way to think about it is Python has specific syntactic and semantic rules that um, encode the most general uh, the most general pointer operations that you would perform in something like C um, in such a manner as to make it safer. Uh, the, the problem with C is that if you 
if you don't know what you're doing with pointers, like you can you can actually badly mess up your computer if um, if you don't know what you're doing. This is again this um, C design philosophy that you know what you're doing and that you're responsible for your for your own actions. Uh, Python uh, Python is like programming with the with the with the safety rails up. All right. um, and I'm I'm saying safety rails instead of training wheels, although it is also kind of like the training wheels. In C, we are actually performing direct memory manipulation, so we can do stuff that is dangerous and stupid and doesn't make any sense. And C will be happy to let us do that. So there you go. Cool. All right. So some stylistic points. In order to avoid the confusion that existed on this slide with respect to what is a pointer and what isn't, it is recommended that you declare your pointers and direct variables on separate lines. Putting some indication that a variable is a pointer in the identifier is a good way to be able to tell which variables are pointers later on. You can, uh, it, it's, it's reasonably common to put ptr or underscore ptr as a part of the identifier itself. This way, when you're, you know, when you're, you know, 100, 200 lines below the declaration of the, of the pointer, you can still tell, oh, this variable is a pointer because it says it's a pointer. So there you go. So let's talk about initial pointing. Like a lot of things in C, uninitialized pointers contain junk data. A pointer will initially point to a random memory cell. That's because uh, the uh, simply declaring a pointer does not overwrite the underlying um, memory. It's important to think about pointers as things having concrete values. Sometimes when we think about pointers, we're tempted to think of them as like these purely abstract entities. That, But the, uh, it's important to remember that pointers are also stored in memory. And because they're stored in memory, they have all of the same little quirks and quick quips that uh, any other variable would have. Like if you initialized, if you if you declared a, an integer or an array and uh, it you didn't initialize it to anything, it would contain junk data as well. So pointers should be initialized to either zero, null, or a value that makes sense. Null is a sim symbolic constant, which is defined in a number of header files, such as stdio and standard def.h. Null is the same thing as zero, but it's preferred for stylistic reasons. So null is zero. The actual literal value of null is zero. However, if you use null instead of zero, it makes your code readable, more readable anyway. Um, so, and because this is a, null is a symbolic constant, we can use it as if it were a literal. Um, you can think, uh, it's probably encoded somewhere as a define. Uh, so the macro rules would apply. But yeah, so it, checking for the null status of a pointer is a thing that we're going to talk about at some point, right at the end when we talk about allocation. So, there we go. Questions? Okay, cool. So, we're done with the nouns. Here come the verbs. Now that we know how to store a memory address, uh, sorry, now we know how to store a memory address, but what good is that if we have no addresses to store? A fair question. Memory addresses are accessed using the ampersand or address of operator. Applied to any identifier, it returns the physical memory address of that in of that identifier, excuse me, and this includes pointers. So if we have int y is equal to 5 and int star pointer, y pointer, 
is a pointer. We can store the address of y in the pointer by uh, assign an assignment operation and the address of operator. This is what's going on. So if uh, so y is 5 and y pointer points to 5. That's sort of in arrow vision. What's actually going on with the underlying concrete values is if you have memory location, um, you know, 600,000, the value in there will be 5, and the compiler will know that we've called that memory location y. In y pointer's case, if it's stored at some other memory location, let's say 500,000, the value inside of Y pointer will be 600,000, which is the actual physical memory address of Y, because that's what we set it to. Um, so there you go. Are there any questions about that? That's an important thing to know. I'll give you guys a moment. That's just my indication, um, a visual cue to that I have given you guys enough time to have heard that question, that call for questions. Good lord, I'm getting a COVID haircut again. Or COVID hair. Lord. Okay, seems like everybody's on the level. So, dereferencing. The inverse operation of address of is pointer de... Oop, I do have a question. Pointer dereferencing. Uh, I'll finish the slide, then I'll answer your question. Um, this is a little confusing, but it's also the star character. In addition, the formatter for pointers the string formatter is percent sign %p. So, if we add to the previous code, the pointer's value is that, and the value pointed to is some integer. Um, we access the integer by dereferencing the pointer. So the pointer's value is uh, this big number, which is a hexadecimal number. We're going to talk about hexadecimal. And the pointer's value, the value pointed to, is five. So there you go. Question. Oop. How does C know where all the memory addresses are? Well, uh, that's a good question. So. And the, the question after that is related. Are they ROM addresses? How long do pointers retain their values in memory? So I'll answer a couple of questions from that first, because they're more specific, and then I'll answer the more general question. So this would be RAM, not ROM. Uh, Read-only memory, that's your hard drive. Your variables, generally speaking, are not stored on your hard drive, like the program that you're executing is never, it's never going to be run directly off the hard drive. It's always going to be stored somewhere in RAM and run from the RAM because RAM is a lot faster. How long do pointers retain their values in memory? Um, for as long as the variable is um, in scope. So just like other variables, pointers have a scope, um, you know, yeah, just like other variables, pointers have a scope. When a when a pointer is, uh, when, when, when all of the variables that a function or a program contains are deallocated, when that program ends, the pointers are also freed up. The memory is deallocated. Um, if you want to get right down technical, the actual values in the memory addresses are not changed when, um, when uh, the program stops running. It's just the, uh, the reference is broken. So that's why you end up with your memory full of junk data. But, um, but yeah, so that's how long, 
uh, pointers have the same lifespan as any other variable. How, long, how does C know where all of the memory addresses are? Well, that's an interesting question. And the answer to that question is, so that's, there's a portion of your compiler that's essentially a table, right? It's a table that look, that maps the variable names and function names, actually, to memory addresses, right? With respect to the, like, the way that the compiler works, eventually all of the variable names and all of the function names are removed and replaced with the memory addresses at a certain part in the compilation. Like, it doesn't matter, that's why it doesn't really matter what you name a variable, right? It's, if, if you give, if you name your, if, if you name, if you have a, a variable name that's like buttfarts McGee, uh, that, it's not like that string is ever going to be actually stored in, uh, you know, in the executable code that your uh, that your um, program produces when it's compiled, right? The string is useless. It, in fact, it would take up a lot of memory just to hold it uh, relative to the size of the program. So all of these, all of these are swapped out for their underlying memory addresses at compile time. So how does it know where all of the memory addresses are. Um, there's an implicit operation that goes on when you declare a variable, and that is the allocation process. When we talk about um, malloc, malloc, that stands for memory allocation, that's a function that you can actually call. When you declare a variable, or when you declare an, an array, or when you declare a pointer, uh, what you are essentially doing is you are you are asking the operating system I would like this much memory please and the operating system is like okay here's a pointer to it the C compiler takes the pointer that that allocation process returns puts it into its table and then that's the address that it uses um, sort of uh, anyway uh, maybe that's not quite right I think I'm I think I'm mixing up compile time and runtime. The allocation the alloc yeah, I am. Sorry. There's like an in there there would have to be like an intermediate representation um that would get replaced with the uh, the allocation. Anyway, um are the addresses assigned randomly or sequentially? Will the values be spread out across several address ranges or all in one set range? Uh generally speaking randomly, um when you allocate memory, it does not end up all in one chunk unless it's an array or something like that. Um, structs are the same way. If you allocate an array or a struct or an array of structs or something like that, all of that will be one continuous chunk of memory. But if you have like some you know index for a loop somewhere, it can be floating around anywhere in memory. Uh, there's no way to predict or tell where a where the operating system is going to allocate your uh, space for your variables. Um, you can you can see where the operating system has allocated you space for the variables after it's been allocated by viewing what the pointer it, to it is. But generally speaking, that information isn't even useful. Um, it's not really that useful to know, um, like, the absolute location of a variable in memory. It's much, much more interesting to know, for example, the relative, uh, the relative memory addresses when you have two pointers pointing to the same array or, some, or portions of the same array, something like that. But we'll we'll talk about this kind of stuff when we get into pointer operations, which we are in. Ho! Oh! So the deadly and dreaded segfault. 
Dereferencing a pointer that points to memory outside your program's allocated memory space causes a fatal runtime error called a segmentation fault. This is most common with null pointers. If you try to, if you try to dereference a null pointer, you will get a seg fault. But it can also happen if you mess up your pointer arithmetic. Pointer arithmetic is something we're going to talk about when we get to arith section. So the computer says, OK, human. Huh? Before you hit compile, listen up. You know when you fa you're falling asleep and you imagine yourself walking or something, and suddenly you misstep, stumble, and jolt awake? Yeah? Well, that's what a seg fault feels like. Double check your pointers, okay? The computer is right. So, seg faults. Because we are working with raw memory addresses, and we are manipulating them, and because we are silly, fallible humans, it is entirely possible that we mess something up. We try to dereference a pointer that doesn't point to anything meaningful. If the thing that it's pointing to is outside of the range... Um, so essentially, um, when your program starts up, the operating system allocates it a certain amount of memory to play with. If you step outside of that bound, then seg fault, and that is a hard crash that kills your program. There you go. So, ampersand and star are inverse operations. Um, I think I have this uh, code. I should have this code. I can load it for you. Load the code! Okay, here it is. So, essentially, we... We're just printing a bunch of the results of a bunch of pointer operations. So we're going to print A, the address of A, a, um, a pointer. Notice that A pointer is being assigned to the address of A up there. Um, dereferencing, uh, we are going to dereference the pointer. We're going to generate a memory address and then dereference it. That leaves you where you start. So we're going to try star. We're going to dereference an address. And then we're going to try addressing a dereference. So, GCC. W all complement dot C out comp. There we go. Comp. So, A is 7, the address of A is this number, the pointer is the same, if we dereference it, we get 7, generating a memory address and then dereferencing it leaves you where you started, so if we take the address and then dereference it directly, we get 7, and if we uncomment this line, you'll be able to see what we get, that's a compiler error invalid type argument of unary star have int. So basically it's complaining that you're trying to dereference something that's not of a pointer type. So that is an invalid operation. Uh, are there any questions about any of that? I'm really happy that 40 people have actually tuned into this because pointers are probably going to be the, they're kind of like the course got, just got real territory. Like everything, everything that you have seen in this course so far should be um, either familiar or comparable to something in Python, but pointers should be like 
a new thing. You sh you should. This is the stuff. If you learn nothing else from this course, learn topic five. So, arrays of pointers. It can be easy to think of pointers entirely symbolically and forget that they too have concrete values in memory. Pointers may be collected and organized in arrays, just like other data types. So if we have a constant char star suite, this means that we have a, a an array of char stars, which as we know, that's a string. A character array is a string. So we've got hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Each element in the array is a pointer to a character array. The fact that our array contains pointers instead of the character arrays themselves means that the character's character array's memory is managed separately from the array pointers. Whereas a 2D array must be rectangular, each character array pointed to by the array of pointers may have a unique length because they are dealt with separately. So here's a visualization of that. When you allocate an array, each element of the array must be the same size, regardless as to whether it is a single integer, whether it is a pointer, whether it is another array, whether it is an array of arrays or an array of array of, array of arrays, every element of an array must be the same size. However, if the element of if each element of the array is a pointer, you have satisfied the condition that all of the elements have to be the same size, but the things that they're pointing to may be of different sizes. So we had a question from the class um, uh, when we were talking about 2D arrays. How do you have like jagged arrays? This is how you have a jagged array. So you can see this is how, um, this is how things would be represented in memory. Ta-da! So, that's all good. Hopefully that's all good. So let's talk about numbers, because we've been talking about all of these, um, we've been talking about these pointers, we've been seeing these long strings of characters, and I'm telling you, that's a number somehow, and maybe you guys, um, it's possible that you guys haven't actually done uh, base systems yet. Actually, let me ask the class. Guys! Hey, guys! Have you guys done base systems? Have you had like a formal definition of hexadecimal or octal yet? I'll wait for your response. If you guys got that in 1MD3, then maybe we don't need to do that section. You did them. Okay, cool. All right. Um, oh, okay. So there is a person, there are some of the people in here didn't take 1D03. So um, for the benefit of, for the benefit of those people who did not take uh, 1D03, Let's go through them, and you guys can get base systems, because base, base systems are going to be import an important thing to understand. Can we change the string corresponding to a pointer without problems? Um, memory leaks, for example. Uh, well, I mean, you can you can perform pointer operations, like you can uh, you can make this. Point, you can allocate a new string in memory and then change this pointer so that it points to the new string and deallocate this one. So yeah, you can do that sort of thing. You can you can use these as dynamic um, dynamic uh, you can use these dynamically. So let's talk about base systems. When we print a pointer, the memory address is formatted in hexadecimal. So we should probably talk about base systems. In general, there are four base systems that are typically used in the context of computing. We have binary, 
octal, decimal, and hexadecimal. Binary is base 2, octal is base 8, decimal is base 10, and hexadecimal is base 16. The binary digits are 1 and 0. The octal dis digits are 0 through 7. The uh, decimal digits are 0 through 9, obviously. And the hexadecimal digits are 0 through 9, and then A, B, C, D, E, and F. The base system used by a numeric representation tells you the value of each place value in the number. So if we have in the decimal system 9618.3492, because everything is base 10, the mathematical interpretation of that is you multiply by 10 to the power of 1 minus whatever the base, whatever the place value is, and that results in your number. In hexadecimal, the base is 16. So each of these digits, uh, you would multiply them by 16 to the power of the place value minus 1, which means that the same number, if you interpret it as a he hexadecimal number, becomes uh, 2,518,168, sorry, this big number, God, 2,518,168,722 in decimal. So you can see that hexadecimal is a far more compact notation because we are, we, um, like a single place value can represent as many as 16 numbers. Anyway, so that's how you would convert. Encoding a decimal number in hexadecimal is much more complicated on paper than it is on a computer. If you are converting from decimal, each hexadecimal digit may be expressed as um, n modulo 16 to the n, um, divided by 16 to the n minus 1, and this would be integer division. Choop choop. So where n is the place value, capital N is the number we are converting, and uh, percent sign is the modulus operator. And keep in mind, this is each digit. One, hexamal, one hexadecimal digit expresses four binary digits in one character, however. Uh, therefore, if the number is binary encoded, we can convert to hexadecimal by considering each group of four bits to be a single digit, after the manner of this chart. So, for the uh, this does the first 16 decimal, uh, the first 16 integers in four different representations. In decimal, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. In binary, this is what the binary representation would be with um, uh, most significant bit first. In octal, you would have uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Notice that 8 and 9 are absent. 8 is, this is 8 in octal. In Hexadecimal, A is decimal 10, B is decimal 11, etc., etc. So that's what a hexadecimal number means. Um, the whole reason for using hexadecimal numbers, because they can express four binary digits in one character, it is... Uh, it only takes one quarter the amount of time to write a hexadecimal number as it does a binary number. So it's, you know, it's used for that purpose. If you were to express all of your uh, pointers in binary, which you could easily do, you know, a pointer, 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 there we go. A pointer is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hexadecimal digits, multiply that by 4, so it would be 48 binary digits, which is be a long, that's just a lot of binary. So hexadecimal is used. Um, cool. 
and and that's kind of our time so we'll talk about literal prefixes tomorrow I'll stay online for just a little bit longer in case anybody has any questions Welcome. Am I doing office hours or is it a TA today? I will be doing the office hours. We'll do them at 1.30 in one hour's time. I'm going to eat some lunch and then I'll be back. This will be the channel, actually. We'll do the, we'll do the meat right here. I guess uh, if you have any questions, you'll save them for office hours then with respect to the people who are here. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention today, folks. I will be seeing you tomorrow, if not later today.